kind of thinking exactly. So start again. First of all, you called it a quirk of your personality, but tell, tell me a little bit more about that. Uh, well, for whatever reason, I may, maybe it was because, you know, I was interested in science early on. Um, I was always really interested in, and thinking about, you know, what if this or what if that? And in the context of, you know, my research, I would, you know, you'd, you'd think, okay, what if I do this? Will it tell me something that's going to allow me then to make progress? Um, but in the space program, I found that was an incredibly useful skill to have to be able to ask the question, okay, what if this happens? What are we going to do about it? And of course, I wasn't the only one. A lot of people were asking the what if questions. And, and you're, a um, lot of the time you spend preparing for a mission is going through that exercise with the other members of, of your crew, the members of your mission control team, uh, maybe the customer team. You know, what if this happens? What are we going to do? What if this happens? What are we going to do? And at some level, you reach uh, kind of a consensus that you've covered the important what ifs. Um, and it is, it is certainly true that one of the things that I was most nervous about when I launched was, are there some what ifs we didn't think about? And in my career, my flying career, yes, there were some what ifs that we hadn't thought about. Most of the time, I would tell you that what ifs that we encountered, we had thought about. And so we knew what to do. But there were a handful of times where something happened that, that we had not thought about. And when that happens, then it's really important for the ground team and the team on orbit uh, to be able to communicate because they need what, what would happen typically is, is once the problem was identified and a plan of attack was developed, the ground would then take that plan and put it into uh, procedures that the crew could execute. Uh, and then their job was to share that with us, and we had to learn it, even though we had never done it before. Uh, we all had uh, basic skills that we could bring to the problem, but uh, and I'll give you a couple of specific examples in a second, but uh, these were generally procedures that, that we had never done. And it was really important for them to be able to communicate what they wanted so that we could do it properly. And it was important for us to ask all of the questions we could think of to make sure that we were totally prepared to do this, this task. Now, one specific example happened on my first space flight, and it was the first mission of the Space Shuttle Discovery. And the Discovery was the third of the shuttles to fly. And as the newest shuttle, they had made some improvements in various parts of discovery, including places where they could save weight by changing out uh, some of the tile insulation for blanket insulation. The blanket insulation was a little bit lighter, but probably more importantly, it was more resistant to damage. The tiles were very fragile and they didn't want you to ever touch them. And the blankets were, were quite robust in terms of, you know, being able to be handled and, uh, so they did make some changes, and one of the changes had an effect that we had not what if and that was it uh, reduced the amount of insulation on uh, an area of the vehicle where two water lines uh, dump water to the to the vacuum of space. One is a freshwater dump line, the other is a wastewater dump line. And what happened to us, frankly, long story short, is when we were dumping fresh water on some day in the middle of the flight, uh, the water froze. And it formed a big icicle on the side of the vehicle. And that was a problem because they were worried it would come off during re-entry and it could hit something in the back that was important. And so they really wanted to get rid of it. But 
they didn't have initially a good plan for how to do that. And I do remember that uh, one of the things they wanted to do was keep open the option of going EVA, doing a spacewalk and get rid of the ice. And the two spacewalkers on that flight were Mike Mullane and me. And I remember when they told us they wanted us to prepare for a spacewalk, which meant we did had to do the suit checkout. We had to depressurize the cabin. We had to do the pre-breathe and all of that stuff. Mullane was ecstatic because we didn't have a scheduled EVA, but now he's going to get to do one. And I thought, this is the dumbest damn thing I've ever heard. <laughs> and the reason I thought that was there was no way to get to where the ice was. I mean, I recall there was some talk about, well, one of us will grab the other by the ankles and hang you over the side. And, or we'd take a, a piece of equipment apart that had a, a metal tube as part of its uh, structure. And we might, you know, go over the side and pound away at it. And I thought all of those ideas weren't very good. And ultimately what they decided to do was to use the robot arm we had on board, um, which turned out to be a better plan. And uh, we had the robot arm on board only in the event that we had to jettison one of the payloads that we had that extended, when it was operating, it extended beyond the payload bay door limit. So if it wouldn't uh, come back in, we'd have to get rid of it so we could close the doors. And you had to get rid of it using the arm, but we didn't plan to have to do that. Hmm. So the ground came up with the plan to use the arm to knock the ice off. Well, that was never something that we had thought about uh, of course, we were trained in how to use the arm, but we had never uh, trained for, for that particular task. And one of the reasons that's, that's important is because we had to violate a flight rule in order to use the arm to get the icicle. And, and the flight rule basically says you can't operate the arm in a place where you can't see it. There's no collision avoidance mechanism other than the operator being alert and not letting the arm hit something. And to get the ice, we were going to have to move the arm in a place where we couldn't see it. So the ground developed a very nice procedure, which uh, then one of the astronauts uh, who had been involved in developing the procedure, it was actually Sally, Sally Ride, um, came over to the Mission Control Center and read they sent us the procedure first so we could get familiar with it. And then, so we had questions and then she walked through how it was developed and what she had seen uh, in the simulator as they were preparing it. And we asked questions back down and, and that whole process took some time. Um, and then we had what looked like a plan we could execute. Um, and in fact we did and it worked and the icicle was gone. And uh, but it required the ground developing this new plan and sharing with us. We had to study it ahead of time, think about questions we would ask and go back and forth with the team on the ground um, before we could execute it. And it worked. It worked well. That general procedure happened many times uh, in the shuttle program. One other story I could tell you was on the Hubble servicing mission in 97, STS-82, we actually, the ground initially discovered that the insulation on the side of Hubble that faces the sun all the time was torn, worn, scorched, looked like it was peeling off. And they were concerned about that. And so uh, what they wanted was for... Um, us to manufacture some temporary patches out of material we actually had on board and then send the two EVA guys out to install it. And so they, they had this, they had to design it on the ground first, of course, you kind of think back to Apollo 13 where, you know, people were off in a room and they're building, you know, mock-ups of, uh, you know, the Lyo <laughs> box that they needed to manufacture. Um, so, they came up with a, they came up with a, a, 
a design for this patch that could be installed by a crew member in a spacesuit. And they sent the procedure up. I think it was 10 pages long or something like that. And our pilot, who was going to be the guy to build this thing, got irritated. He didn't want, you know, 10 pages of a procedure. And he, he told them, you know, send me a picture. And so they sent him five more pages of a procedure. <laughs> and he was getting more and more upset. And he said, send me a damn picture. So finally, in those days, we actually had a, a thermal printer. So they actually could send you a picture. Uh, so they sent up a drawing of what they wanted this thing to look like. And that's what he needed to be able to do the job. So, you know, I guess one lesson learned in all of this, which could be generally applicable, is, is think about, you know, how people learn. And the various ways, you know, that your, your students may, may learn. Some will be visual learners. Others uh, want to hear, hear it, the, verbal, the verbalization. Uh, Scott was definitely a visual learner. Once he saw a picture, he knew exactly what to do, and he built this thing, and it was gorgeous. And the guys took it outside and installed it, and, um, and it was on the Hubble Space Telescope until 2009, we had actually all signed it in black Sharpies uh, before the guys took it out and installed it. So our autographs were on Hubble Space Telescope for, for you know, a little more than 10 years. And the guys on the last servicing mission took it off to install a more sophisticated thermal patch. And I ran into Grunsfeld. John Grunsfeld was the actual astronaut that did it uh, at a meeting in uh, Austin in 2010. And I asked him, you know, what happened to our patch that had our signatures on it? And he said, I lost it. And he, he actually lost it overboard. So I guess it stayed in orbit for a while, but uh, it was no longer on HST and we didn't get it back. Following along with that, when, when you, so you talked about how people learn, what would you say if anything was different about listening when that critical a situation existed? Um, well, it's, it's, it's obviously very important to make sure you understand exactly what they're saying. Now, we had an advantage because <clears throat> we, through years of training, of course, we had a common uh, language. <coughs> and uh, so technical terms, you know, run ambiguous. That was important is, is the com communication needs to be unambiguous. Um, but we really needed to make sure we totally understood not only what they wanted us to do, but if they uh, had any potential issues or warnings they wanted to share. Like, you know, in the case of the ice, you could run the arm into the payload bay door if you, if you violated a certain limit that they gave us. And so, okay, that important safety tip. Yeah, don't, don't go beyond 30 inches, you know, <laughs> in this one dimension. <clears throat> um, so, yeah, we did have that advantage that, you know, the basics, you know, were, were things that everybody spoke about in the same way. Uh, but the, the task was critical. And so you were listening very intently. And like I say, focusing on, on making sure you understood uh, exactly what they wanted to do and, and also understand if there are any, you know, warnings. Uh, I remember one other story, speaking of listening intently, it doesn't have anything to do with education so i probably shouldn't tell it but um on on that same flight with the ice um we were told before launch to expect what nasa called a vip phone call normally that means the president and so we were prepared when they called us up one day and said you know hey we're gonna you're gonna get a phone call from the president at this time and and 
the re- reason I mentioned that is that, that was pretty common back in the early days of shuttle. The president or the vice president would generally call. And in anticipation of that possibility, our commander, Hank Hartsfield, uh, vented because <laughs> he was always upset that the president always wanted to talk to the commander and the commander would talk to the president, but none of the rest of the crew ever got to say anything. So he said, you know, if Reagan calls, we're all going to talk to him. Okay. And so Reagan calls. And of course, he, by protocol, he would talk first to Hank and they exchanged uh, some words. And then the president would, would say or ask something else. And then the pilot would answer. And that was Henry's plan is that once every time the president says something, the next person will respond on behalf of the crew. And for whatever reason, I was last. And we started losing uh, calm with the ground <laughs> while Reagan was talking. And I was the only one that hadn't spoken. And I was going to have to respond to whatever the president said. But I was starting. It was garbled. And I now I'm panicked because I can't really understand what Reagan is saying. And I'm supposed to say something. And then I picked up just enough to recognize that he re- was reciting high flight. And fortunately, I knew high flight. And so I was able to then respond in context. Um, and, and truthfully, the only reason I tell you that is, you know, we're talking about the importance of communication. And I, that was, I was more panicked at that moment, I think, than probably any other, you know, episode that involved communications. <laughs> That is a great story, and kudos on listening that well, picking up what he was saying, and for for having the knowledge of the the piece of poetry that you needed. Yeah, the the stars were shining favorably on me that day. I wanted to to build on that great story you had about Commander Hartsfield, uh, basically saying. You know, it's great to take a call from this VIP call from the president, but I want to really focus on the team and the ensemble, right? And so much around right. ensemble success, particularly in work environments, but also for young learners is based on team environments, making other people look good, setting other people up to succeed and that sort of thing. I was wondering if you could just speak on the importance of teamwork, that ensemble environment, either for adults or young learners as well, and, and sort of what that means to you. Well, I think, you know, particularly in the space program, everybody probably at least instinctively feels that teamwork is, is so important. And uh, it is of course. And, and part of the reason is because the task is so uh, demanding that, you know, no one person can do it. You have to have several people to do it and they have to almost work as one person in order to get it done. And that includes not just the flight crew, but also the crew on the ground. Um, you know, to the point where, uh, you know, we train for that, of course, train for the teamwork. Um, I can share a couple of stories uh, to illustrate that point. Uh, one of the things I remember telling the crews I flew with after my first flight was, you know, you go in the sim and you have a good day or you have a bad day, but nobody says, you know, hey, everybody on the crew except Holly was really good today. Holly really screwed up. Never to say that. What they say is the crew screwed up or the crew did a good job. So whatever you do, good or bad, it's going to reflect on on the team, on the crew. And uh, I always thought that was kind of an important thing to keep in mind. Um, On, we had a... (laughs) We had something called Hoot's Rule on my second flight. Hoot was the commander. He was one of my best buddies in the astronaut program, Hoot Gibson. And early in our training, uh, we had a problem during ascent in the simulation. And what Hoot needed to do was to reach down on the center console and flip a switch and then push a button and that action would separate the solid rocket boosters. Well, the problem was he reached down and flipped the wrong switch. And the consequence of that was it separated the tank 
and not the solid rocket booter boosters. And so suddenly we, the engine shut down and we died. And after that, as our, our team on board, we developed a rule, which we named after Hoot, that nobody takes a critical action without somebody else looking at it and saying, yes, that's correct. So, for example, in this case, he would have grabbed the wrong switch and I would have said, nope, wrong switch. Or I would have confirmed, yes, that's the correct switch. And we did that for the whole training cycle and we did it in flight. And uh, we thought that was, I mean, some things you get to know how to do just by heart because you've done it so many times. But our rule was you don't do that. If you have somebody watch you, if it's critical, you wait till somebody's available. If it's not critical, but somebody's available anyway, you're not doing something right now, you ask them to come over and, and watch you do it. Um, and uh, that kind of teamwork, maybe a little bit above, above and beyond what other crews did. Um, so I can give you another uh, instance on the Hubble servicing mission. Um, <clears throat> we had <laughs> that mission, the activities on any of the Hubble servicing missions were highly complex. Uh, and it involved the ground, it involved the crew flying the orbiter, the commander and the pilot. It involved the guy operating the robot arm. In this case, that was me. Two guys in the payload bay doing the spacewalk, doing the actual repairs, and another off-duty EVA crew member that's orchestrating uh, the activities in the payload bay. So there's a lot of communication going on. Uh, some of it doesn't involve me. Uh, and uh, so, so we developed a couple of ways to try to minimize any confusion or ambiguity that might take place. So if you've got two guys in the payload bay, one's holding an instrument to go into Hubble, and the guy that's not holding the instrument says, go to the right two inches. Is he talking to me and he wants me to move the arm? Or is he talking to the guy holding the instrument and he wants him to move it? And so we had to develop some protocols to make sure there was no ambiguity. In a case like that, what we decided was if the guy who's not holding the instrument says to move, he's talking to the guy holding the instrument. The only guy that can ask for the arm to move is the guy standing on the end of it. And that worked to clear up any ambiguities. But the point about the teamwork, I guess, is that there was so much going on. I remember Greg Harbaugh was on the end of the arm and he was replacing a device on the telescope called the SADI, the solar array drive electronics. And I was watching over his shoulder because he had a TV camera mounted up here primarily so the ground could see what he was doing if they wanted to. And he's in there working. And the commander's talking to the ground about something the uh, EVA coordinator is talking to the ground about something else on a different comm channel. And Greg wants me to move the arm. And we had worked together so long that Greg knew that I'd be watching him on the TV. And so Greg just used his hand and he pointed the direction he wanted to move. And I moved the arm and then Greg held up his fist when he wanted me to stop. And we did all of that without even we communicated, but we didn't talk. And there's just little things like that where you work, you know, find effective ways to work with your teammates to get the job done. Yeah, that's such a great story. And I love the idea of like developing that shorthand as well with your teammates and finding different ways to communicate and also looking at the communication nuance you were speaking about earlier around like, Hey, just send me a photo and sort of that know your audience piece. I right. was curious about um, your approach to um, habits and learning over the years. So if we look at um, content for younger learners who might be looking at, look, how can I be more effective in school environments? Um, how can I be more effective in my day-to-day, -day, you know, coursework and classes and working hard? You know, um, are there, were there habits that you developed as a young learner or any daily routines or even just kind of rituals to excel at what you do, to do what you've done with your career that you still sort of do today? You find yourself going, yeah, I still do that. Um, somewhere along the line, and I don't remember when, 
uh, I was fortunate enough to develop critical thinking skills, or at least some level of critical thinking ability. Um, I would say, you know, if, if I had to suggest, you know, something that students could habitually do that would pay off both in school and later in life, it's to work on those critical thinking skills. Um, I, it, it came, I think it came somewhat naturally to me as a student. Um, and then, of course, you're forced into it in the NASA environment. Uh, so I was glad I had a, an aptitude for it. I mean, in, in a sense, it's related to the you know, whole what if mentality. Um, but uh, I really sort of confronted it when I went back to teaching. And I would have students do poorly on an exam or an assignment, and they would come talk to me, and they say, well, I studied. I don't know why I did so badly. And I would say, well, tell me how, how you studied. I mean, did you read the assigned, you know, portions of the textbook? Yeah, I read them. Did you just read them? I mean, tell me how you read them. Did you, did you find anything you didn't understand as you were reading it? If so, did you try to figure out how to uh, clear up the misunderstanding? Uh, and I found that more students than I probably appreciated, they would read the assignment. Some of them didn't. <laughs> but the ones that did, often they would, they would read it, and then they would put the book down and felt they had done something without really thinking about what they were reading and asking questions about it. I, I encouraged my students in class, you know, if I make an assertion that something is the case, it's okay to say, wait a minute, you know, on what basis do you make that assertion or what's your evidence for saying that? Or how can you, you know, how can you claim that that's true? You know, I, I want to be challenged if you, you know, if you want to know the details. So uh, I really think that an emphasis uh, as early as it makes sense in school to develop those critical skills that, you know, everybody's going to need because, you know, critical thinking allows you to make better decisions as a person. <laughs> you don't have to be an astronaut or a scientist. Um, one of the things that, that I, I told my students that I would normally do was I would read op-eds written by people that I usually disagree with. And I would do that because I wanted to, you know, challenge my beliefs. You know, maybe they, often they didn't convince me, but occasionally I'd read something and go, oh, well, that's interesting. I hadn't thought of it that way. And so it's, uh, you guys know better than I that anymore you can spend your whole life listening and reading about things that you already agree with. And, you know, so the challenge is to, you know, challenge yourself to, you know, challenge, challenge what <laughs> I, one story that I, I did share with my class was um, we had some faculty members in our department at KU who were involved in the search for the Higgs particle back, you know, 10 years ago or so. And, and it was discovered, I think in 2012, I'm not, I don't remember exactly, which was a, you know, momentous moment in particle physics that the Higgs particle had been found. <clears throat> and one of my colleagues claimed that she was actually disappointed. And I asked her why. And she said, well, because imagine how interesting it would have been had we not found it. <laughs> and I thought, well, that's an interesting perspective on it. So, you know, it, the, you know, maybe part of the fun in science is, you know, challenging yourself to, you know, find new questions that you don't have the answers to. But again, it all gets back to, you know, if I was going to emphasize one habit that students could benefit from, I would say, you know, every day do something that, that might improve your critical thinking ability. I love that because it's, you know, um, Mimi would love your thoughts as well, but it's so important, especially for, for young audiences today, right? Who get, you know, we, we get caught in our algorithms and our bubbles, yep. particularly on social media. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to seek out differing points of view to come up with your own point of view. I think it's a really critical lesson, especially for young learners. 
hilarious. Yeah. And, oh. and again, you know, I don't know how I developed it. I probably give my father some credit. Um, even when I was fairly young, I had the ability to, to ask, I wonder if I'm right about that. And, you know, I would ch try to challenge myself in terms of, of, you know, here's a point of view I have, you know, wonder if I need to look at that again. And uh, <laughs> I used to tell my students too, uh, in the advanced astronomy classes that, you know, part of critical thinking is when you get an answer to a question, ask yourself, does this make any sense? And you might save yourself if you look at it, you go, no, it really doesn't. And then you can go back and figure out, you know, where you went wrong. I never really got very far with them except for one student who would write on his homework. Generally, when he got the answer wrong, he would go, yeah, this doesn't make any sense. And then he would move on to the next question. <laughs> there was never any evidence that he went back and tried to figure out what he had done wrong. It was a start, but, um, but yeah, you know, I was, I, again, I think probably my dad has, maybe he challenged me uh, to the point where I was able to eventually challenge myself on, on things that I thought were true or, or, or opinions I had about things. Mm -hmm. There's a book called Think Again. Um, I think the author's Adam Smith, maybe. And the, he cites research that says that more test takers who go back and reconsider an answer, you know, which you can see on some tests by erase marks <laughs> and, and other tests because the computer is tracking what they're doing, that actually the, the adage we always heard was stick with your first instinct, it's usually right, isn't true. <laughs> and I think that's really that is in keeping with what you're saying. And I think that's important, not only for young audiences, but for anyone who wants to try and keep a, a nimble mind. So I love that. Yeah. We did have one question about um, uh, criteria for pushing forward with a launch or aborting from a launch. So there was a story that we wanted to ask you about <coughs> from STS-41D, um, where a lot of folks today have put ourselves in the mind of like professionals working in their jobs. Not, they don't really have criteria or the mission rules that you had on when to, to move forward, when to not. So I was curious, um, based on this, this quote that you have as well, and we thought we'd be a lot higher at Miko, <laughs> we thought it was great. What, 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 what happened and, and how did you respond? Yeah, so um, maybe to make the story complete, I would go back 24 hours uh, on the, a launch attempt the previous day. And things had gone well uh, until we got to T minus 20 minutes where there's a built-in hold of 10 minutes. And when we come out of the hold and start counting down to nine minutes where the next built-in hold is, the first thing the commander does is he takes the backup computer to operate. And when Hank did that, the computer did not go to operate. And so I kind of knew we were not going to launch that day. Um, I did not know uh, whether they'd be able to replace the computer in 24 hours and give us a chance to go the next day. They were heroic down at the Cape and they came out and they replaced it, put a new computer in. So, okay, now on the day in question, we're coming out of the T minus 20 minute hold. And Hank reaches up and grabs the computer, takes it to run, and it goes to run. So life is good. We go down to T minus nine minutes, where we, that's the final place you can hold. Well, that's not true. It's the final place you plan to hold. And then you come out of the T minus nine minute hold and you count down to zero. There are a handful of places in the last nine minutes where you can hold if you need to. And the last one's at 31 seconds. And so as we're passing 31 seconds, last possible hold point, Hank says, well, gang, we're going to go now unless something really bad happens. <laughs> and we count down to engine start, which is about seven seconds. And <clears throat> the engine start, and I feel the 
the orbiter begin to shake and you hear the noise and then suddenly it gets really quiet except for <laughs> the master alarm bell that's going off. And I, my immediate thought was that's not supposed to happen. And the reason I thought that was just by chance for about a month, I would guess before the launch attempt, the simulator had been having problems with the model. And so about half of the times we tried to launch in the sim, we would shut down on the pad. And the training crew, I remember, were, were always very apologetic about that. But we played it for real every time it happened. And there's about one page of emergency actions the crew takes in that event. Uh, and so we were actually pretty familiar with it because we've been doing it for, you know, off and on for the last month. Uh, and so my thought was, this is just like the sims we've been having. And I didn't expect that to happen on the real launch day. But we went through the procedures because, you know, it was by now it was kind of instinctive. And I remember about 15 seconds after the abort, we hear on the loops, uh, one of the operators in the launch control center saying, break, break. Uh, they think that engine three is still running. And I was pretty sure there were no engines running, but they called up and they wanted us to manually shut down all the engines with push buttons we had on the center console. So Mike Coates, our pilot, did that. Um, and after we got, you know, this one page of emergency procedures accomplished, um, we really just wanted to sit there and follow along in the discussion to see uh, you know, if, if we could make some sense out of what happened. Um, we did not want to, we did not want to ask questions. We didn't want to interfere. We didn't want to step on somebody that might be, they're still going through some, you know, emergency procedures of their own. Uh, so uh, mostly we're just listening. Uh, the comment I made, I actually didn't make right away. I think it was, it was, you know, may have been 20 minutes after the abort before I said what I said. And, and, you know, from my seat, which was between the pilot and the commander, uh, I'm on my back and I can look out the overhead windows and I can still see the pad surface. And when I looked out and saw that, that was when I said, well, I thought we'd be higher than this at Miko. Um, I think some of my crew thought it was funny. I think Mulane was sitting next to me and I, he, I think he wanted to punch me out. I think he thought, you know, that this was a serious situation and people shouldn't be joking about it. Um, yeah, maybe he was right, but I thought, you know, I would try to lighten the moment a little bit. Um, <clears throat> after a while, we heard people talking about fire. And, you know, that was, that was of concern. Oh. And um, I, <laughs> I used to joke that, you know, well, you know, yeah, there's there's a fire, but I'm sitting in a vehicle that's designed to take, you know, several thousand degrees during reentry. Uh, on the other hand, it's attached to, you know, half a million gallons of liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. So maybe fire is not a good thing. What had happened was the, the shutdown uh, had allowed some of the hydrogen to, to flow through the nozzles and it had caught fire. But hydrogen burns without a visible flame, so nobody knew it for a while until part of the orbiter caught fire, and then they could see it. And then we started wondering, uh, well, you know, maybe we should make a break for it. We're trained that if you're you know, in the vehicle and the closeout crew isn't present and you need to get away, you can open the hatch, run across the fixed service structure, and jump into slide wire baskets release the basket and you'll go down a cable to the ground and then there's a bunker and you can get in the bunker. Um, nobody had ever done that. Actually, nobody ever did it for real in the whole shuttle program history. But we talked about it, uh, whether we would do that or not. Um, I had worked several missions uh, <clears throat> as an astronaut support person for early launches in the shuttle down at KSC. So I was very familiar with the Launch Control Center and all of those procedures. 
And I recommended that based on my experience that we should stay put unless they tell us to evacuate. It turns out that was probably a good thing because we might have run right through a fire that we didn't know was there. Um, what caused the problem was a limit set in the software that uh, constrains uh, how slowly a valve can move at engine start. So when you know if the valve is sluggish, it'll violate this time limit and the engine will uh, shut down. Um, you'd rather have a problem on the ground than, than have one in flight. In fact, you know, the, I don't know who said it first, it wasn't me, but you know, I've always believed in, you know, you're better off, you know, it's better to be on the ground wishing you were flying than to be flying wishing you were on the ground. And that was, uh, that was the case that day. People said, well, you know, you had an engine failure and I would say, well, no, <laughs> it worked exactly like it was supposed to. The problem as it turned out was there was some debris in the hydraulic fluid, some silting, and that caused this one valve to operate more slowly than it was designed to. And that's what the software picked up on. One of the, there were several consequences from that. One of which was they developed a test they could do at about T minus four minutes and counting where they would jiggle the valves a little bit and then they could look at the signature and they could tell whether uh, they were going to work properly. Uh, so that was good. They also, after our flight, installed infrared sensors <clears throat> around the pad. So if there was a fire, a hydrogen fire, they'd be able to see it through the heat signature and not just look at what they could see on the, on the TV cameras. So that was, yeah, that was pretty exciting when it happened. Uh, Actually, the, the world wouldn't have known what I said, <clears throat> uh, except Hank had to do a press conference. <laughs> and he told everybody what I had said. And if you, you know, advance 15 years to July of 99, uh, when we had another abort right before, actually it was, you know, I think it was two tenths of a second before the engines would have started uh, on SCS-93. Uh, people have from time to time asked me whether I had a quote from that mission <laughs> and I did, but nobody knows about it because Eileen Collins, who was the commander, didn't have to do a press conference. <clears throat> I don't know if I should say what I said. <laughs> I <wanna> know. <laughs> I said, I'm getting too old for this, you know, stuff. <laughs> Insert stuff here. Yeah. Uh, I'm trying to remember whether, uh, I think that was, I don't remember the sequence. We scrubbed one once for weather and once for the, it was a haz, hazardous gas sensor reading, but I think it was the night that they were lifting the Liberty Bell seven off of the floor of the Atlantic. Huh. It was How either that night or the next night, but the first night we scrubbed, uh, the guys were out, you know, bringing up the Liberty Bell seven. That's great. So I want to just jump into something that you were talking about first, that it wasn't really a failure because the system worked and it, it simply, there wasn't a launch. And then you went on to say that that failure led to infrared cameras, that the ability to test those valves. So can you talk a little bit about how, NASA in general uses failure to adapt and how we can translate that into our personal lives. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> obviously, you know, it's almost a cliche to say, you know, you should learn from your failures. Mm -hmm. And I think we were pretty good at that. Um, you know, something would go wrong. We would, we would uh, find a way to make the system more robust um, in fact, I was talking to somebody just the other day about, um, the fourth Hubble servicing mission, uh, because for that mission, I was in a management job and we had an issue with one of the Freon loops on board the orbiter. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, it was not cooling like it should have been. 
And in fact, it was not cooling at a rate that violated the flight rule. And the remedy is the crew comes home because if the only other one fails, you're not going to be able to keep the equipment from overheating during your entry. And so um, that was a problem we got to wrestle with as managers. And the reason I bring it up here is because, you know, the flight rule had been written probably before STS-1. And we hadn't really looked at it until we had the situation actually arise. Once the situation actually arose, now we have 20 years of actual flight data. And we have the data that we're seeing from the vehicle itself on orbit. And we could suddenly make an, a, a rational decision that the flight rule limit is too conservative. And the mission's important, but if the right thing to do is come home, we would come home. But we were able to argue that we don't need to come home. We're smarter now than we were when we wrote the rule 20 years ago. Um, so we were, you know, we were good at, at making improvements when we had the data. We were good at making improvements when we had failures. Now, one thing I have shared with audiences over the years is I, I at least think there's sort of a third component to this, and that is you need to learn from your successes. And you could point to Challenger and say, we had successfully flown uh, 24 flights, I guess, before Challenger. But there were warning signs that the system was not behaving the way it was designed. And of course, that's been you know well documented. You know, lots of books have been written about all of that. Um, and I forget her name, but she came up with the the notion of the normalization of deviance. You know, yeah, it's not working the way. It's supposed to, but you've seen it work that way a dozen times and nothing bad happened. <clears throat> the same is true, frankly, of the Columbia accident. <clears throat> we knew that foam was coming off the tank. We just didn't think it was a threat to the vehicle. And so, you know, you can, you can at least raise the issue of you know, yeah, we were successful, but is there something, some lesson learned that that we should have uh, taken advantage of? And the answer clearly in hindsight is yes. Now, I would go on to say, you know, for every flight, you know, there are literally thousands of problems that you have to resolve. And you have to give priority to the ones that look like they're the biggest problems. And uh, I, I would tell you that before... Uh, we lost Columbia from the foam strike. There was a discussion at flight readiness review for a previous, for a, uh, an earlier flight uh, that foam had come off and hit the bottom of the solid rocket booster and it caused some damage to the solid rocket booster. So that, that was viewed as kind of a turnaround issue, maybe a money issue because you got to repair it but not a safety issue. On the other hand, at that same review, there was a discussion of how the crew, this was a space station shuttle joint mission where the shuttle had docked. And this, one of the crew members was using the space station arm and Brout drove it through the payload bay of the shuttle. The crew member was looking at a TV monitor that was showing something other than what the crew member thought she was looking at. So at the time, that seemed like a bigger problem is, you know, how do we prevent crew member from having poor situational awareness and, and doing something that would be catastrophic? <laughs> um, and so the only, again, the only reason I mention that is, you know, in hindsight, it's easy to say, well, you should have paid more attention to the phone. But at the time, that didn't seem like it was the biggest issue. So, yeah, so I would say, you know, we learn from our data, we learn from our failures, but you also need to learn from your successes. Now, that's sometimes hard to sell. If you go to a program manager and say, you know what? Yeah, this has been working, but I'm kind of concerned about it. And I'd like to spend a million dollars to make an improvement. You know, guess how far that'll go. You know, so in a constrained budget environment where you got a lot of demands, uh, it's, it's often hard to sell 
you know, things that are going to make it better rather as opposed to things that you absolutely have to fix. Yeah, that's really interesting. You know, Mimi, just one quick build and then I went handed to you. Um, just that notion of learning from your successes is really tough for professional these days because there's this culture of scale more, 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 let's grow, 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 grow versus let's do something repetitively a number of times really, really well. Right. And so it's that notion of like, let's keep doing what we're doing really well. And I think a lot of companies, I think there's a growing trend for companies to say, what do we need to be three X the size next year? Or <laughs> should we just keep doing the same thing we're doing really well? Yeah. Good point. That is a great point. And I think, one of the things that occurred to me is how do you in those processes where whether it's a plan for growth or just day-to-day -day operations, how do you build in holds so that you can consider it all seems to be going well, but is it really, or hold on, is there something we can improve on for the next phase or I don't know. Yeah, that's tough. I mean, you know, I mean, going back to the space program, <clears throat> you know, we were, once we got SCS-1 airborne, it was all about the next launch or the next few launches. And um, now we did, I would say, uh, you know, unfortunately, we did, after the Challenger accident, have time where we did uh, stop and in addition to redesigning the solid rocket booster, part of what I was involved in was uh, what are the other safety issues that we should be thinking about? And in fact, that was motivated in part by the Rogers Commission that, you know, and, and they were concerned that we, the astronauts, weren't aware of any issues with the solid rocket booster joints. And so then they said, well, what are you aware of that you're worried about? And that produced a whole bunch of, of things that some of which we did, some of which we didn't, um, that, you know, one thing that comes to mind is, is uh, uh, tires and brakes. The orbiter was heavier than it was intended to be when it was built. And we were really stressing the tires and brakes. In fact, we had had some brake failures and we were worried about, you know, not just being able to stop on the runway, but what happens if you get a brake failure, <clears throat> locks up a wheel, you blow a tire, and now you skid off the side, you could do catastrophic damage to the orbiter. But the tires and brakes generally had worked, but we didn't have much margin. And so that was one of the things that we were able to get <coughs> improvements. On, on a more robust uh, set of brakes for the orbiters. We also ended up later in the program with a drag chute to help, you know, take the energy out of the brakes and help us slow down. And there were, there were I don't know, there were probably a dozen or so things that we identified after Challenger that we were able to improve, even though they had operated, you know, successfully up to that time. Some of them were software changes that, you know, we had been interested in that would make an abort easier to fly, for example. Hmm. <clears throat> kind of puts my day-to-day -day existence in such stark contrast to, <laughs> guess anything I do really important. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. It is, <laughs> yes. <I'll answer> <laughs> Definitely, yes. sure. The, the idea of the growth, when you're talking about the tires and brakes, just, just one quick build on that. Um, the idea of a single point of failure, you know, so we, we've heard of this notion of a single point of failure right. and wanting to really, you know, focus on that. It seems like that's, that's something you would want to focus on so that if the tires fail on a landing, that it's a single point of failure, right? There's not a backup set of tires and a backup no. set of yeah, tires. If you, if, if you, yeah, if you blow the tires. tire, that's you're going to have to deal with whatever results. Mm -hmm. um, and now, now, you know, for single point failures, 
you know, in some cases, there's nothing you can do. For example, you know, if one of your SRB fails, you know, you're out of Schlitz. But uh, so in, in those cases, we had a requirement that you had to over design it by 40 percent. So we, we used to call that the 1.4 factor of safety. So for whatever, you know, whatever design constraint you had for something that was a single point failure, it had to be 40 percent more robust than you thought you needed. Um, yeah, the tires was, were, were kind of tires and brakes were you could have and we did ultimately improved the system with more robust tires and brakes. I mean, it, it, the, the problem, as I said, was they had been designed for an orbiter that was that weighed, you know, 20 or 30,000 pounds less than the orbiter we actually got. And so we knew it was an issue, although uh, the, you know, nobody was really motivated to do anything about it uh, until the downtime after Challenger and we identified it as one of the, of the safety things. Yeah, but you know, to your point earlier, I guess about, <clears throat> you know, we never took a, you know, a safety stand down as such, except when there was an accident. You know, we never said, hey, we're gonna stop flying for six months and go, you know, review all of our, you know, data, all of our requirements. Um, it's a luxury that, that we didn't feel we had and I'm sure most businesses don't feel they, they have to do that. You know, we had one, you know, the Challenger accident forced one on us. Um, and in addition to the safety improvements, we did go back and we spent a year going through all of our requirements and asking, you know, is this still valid? Is this a good requirement? Can we get rid of this requirement? Um, so that we actually ended up with a better set of program requirements, you know, when we resumed flying, that was beneficial. But I mean, you could argue that, you know, wouldn't that be a sensible thing to do just as a normal course? And the answer probably is, yeah, it would be, but, you know, we had a lot of people tied up and doing that for a year and that was inconsistent with, um, you know, being able to fly the manifest at the same time. When you were talking about the um, flight, I don't remember which mission you said it was, where you realized that the flight rule limit no longer applied. And you said that you realized the rules didn't fit the scenario and you had more data than you'd had originally. But who made the decision to say, okay, go ahead and uh, you know, what, what's the leadership takeaway from that? Yeah. So ignore the rule. Yeah. We didn't actually ignore the rule. And I, and I would argue, I will answer your question, but I would argue that um, at least the way I and many others interpreted the flight rules is you do the best you can uh, writing down all of the you know, responses to the what ifs. And a lot of this, of course, was done before the first flight because you had to. You had to have a set of operating practices because in real time, you may not have the chance to sit down and think, what should we do? You need to have thought of that ahead of time. You know, if this happens, I'm going to do this. If this happens, I'm going to do this. And you do the best you can do. But I always viewed it as it's really more of a sort of a trip point. I've now violated a rule. So I now want to sit down and look at the specifics of the situation I've got. One simple example that I've used uh, a lot of times is our night landing on STS-93. Eileen was the pilot, well, the commander, she was flying the vehicle. And it was a night landing. And we had a rule, flight rule that says, uh, if you land at night, the crosswind limit is gonna be more restrictive. I think it was 12 knots, a daytime landing, you could do 15 knots of crosswind. And the reason was because if it's dark and the commander is trying to land and there's a crosswind, he or she may not be able to sense a drift as easily as if it's daylight. And so you might not be able to correct in time. Okay, that makes a hell of a lot of sense. On that night, as we were landing in Florida, it was clear. It was midnight and there was a full moon directly overhead. It was just like it was daytime. And so I would have been totally okay 
if they had said, well, we're going to up the night landing limit for your landing to 15 knots because you can see just as well with the moon as you could in the daytime. And that was true. I don't think we needed it that night. The crosswind wasn't that bad. So there's always some circumstances that are a little bit different from what you just presumed when you wrote the rule kind of in the abstract. And in this case, so specifically what, what we do, we have something called the mission management team. And there's a mission management team leader. And the team is made up of representatives from all of the relevant disciplines. So there's somebody from mission operations. I was the guy from flight crew operations. There's somebody from engineering. There's somebody from uh, uh, safety. Uh, and uh, we get together and discuss all issues that come up during the flight, make a decision. It's chaired by, normally it was the deputy <coughs> program director for the shuttle program. And so I heard about this problem actually on the plane coming home from the launch that we had this uh, reduced flow in one of the Freon coolant loops. And so once we got to Houston, we gathered together as a mission management team and talked about the situation. What do we know? What data do we have? Okay, we've got, we know the, the uh, flow is restricted in that one loop. Do we know what caused it? Well, probably not for sure, but it seemed like it's probably debris that may have been in the line that shook loose at launch and wedged into a filter. It was interesting to me because the previous time Columbia had flown, that was the vehicle in question on, on the mission, it was Columbia, was ours, SS-93. And we had a pre-existing condition. We had a wire that was frayed in the payload bay and the, the vibration of launch caused it to contact uh, metal and cause a short. So we had a pre-existing condition and the shake, rattle, and roll of launch caused the problem. It, was, it seemed like it was kind of the same thing. They, there was probably debris in the line, and then the shake, rattle, and roll caused it to, to come loose and, and clog a filter. So we didn't know exactly what the problem was, but that was probably it. Now, if, if that's the problem, is it likely to get worse? Well, probably not. If that's the problem... How's the other loop? It's fine. So we don't expect, I mean, it could still fail. I mean, but we don't expect the same problem to happen in the other loop because if it were to have happened, it would have happened by now. What data do we need in order to make a decision? Well, what's the risk? The risk is you've got a degraded loop. What if your good loop fails? And now you are constrained on how much cooling you can provide to the avionics you need to get home. And if it's low enough, the avionics boxes could overheat and that might be the end of the mission if you're, you're trying to go through reentry and landing. So the threat is, what if the good loop fails? Can I convince myself that if that were to happen, that I have enough capacity in the remaining loop to get us home. And to answer that question, you need to know, well, how much capacity do I need? And so after we met, putting those questions and others on the table, we chartered a team to go off and look at the actual heat loads being generated by the equipment uh, on Columbia, how much we would need to dissipate for reentry and come back tomorrow and report. And so they did that. They came back and they said, you know, this is how much cooling we're going to need. And uh, if it doesn't get worse, the degraded loop can handle that. And I pointed out, I recall, that what they had done in their analysis was they had assumed that you would turn on all of the normal equipment you would use and you, for entry and landing, and you would turn it on at the time specified in the flight plan. And I pointed out, you know, you actually don't have to do that. 
you don't have to turn some of these things on until later. You don't need them right now. You need them later. The reason you turn them on now is because you're assuming the crew is strapped in their seat and they can't reach the switches. But I can tell you from experience that <clears throat> I don't need to be strapped in that early. And you can delay turning this on for 15 or 20 minutes and I'll get it before I strap in for good. So we had margin. We could, we, that wasn't the plan, but if we needed it, we had it. So here we are. Now we know that if the good loop fails, we have analysis that says the degraded loop will be adequate for entry and landing. And even if it degrades a bit more, we've got extra tricks we can play that'll keep the heat load down and enable us to do a safe entry and landing. So <clears throat> that was presented and it was discussed. And everybody on the management team had a chance to listen and, you know, make suggestions like I did or take issue with, with the analysis. And in the end, everybody, I, I actually don't know whether the chairman of the team made a decision or it was just kind of the consensus that, that, yeah, the, this is, we're okay in this situation that, you know, we didn't think the good loop would fail, but if it did, we still could get the crew home. So we were good to go. I just have so many takeaways from that, that had you not had someone on your team who'd actually experienced the situation, flipping the switches and when you actually need to be harnessed and all of that. It, 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 so it's experience plus analysis plus simulation is what I wrote down or it's yeah. key to all of that success. I, I was trying to remember uh, of course, we had mission management team meetings all the time when we were flying. Uh, sometimes it would be, hey, things are going great. So, you know, we'll meet again tomorrow at, you know, noon or whatever. Um, sometimes there'd be problems we'd have to talk about. There probably were times, but I can't think of any, where the chairman actually made a decision. I mean, I didn't mean it to sound like that. You know, where there was, a, where there was disagreement in the room and... And the chairman said, well, I'm, I'm chairing this and this is what we're going to do. Mm -hmm. I am sure that never happened. If there was, if there was, there was rarely contention, but if there was disagreement or somebody thought there's some data that I think would be useful that we don't have yet, we would generally go get it. So, uh, again, I can't, I can't, there may have been some, but I can't think of any case where the decision wasn't the decision of the group. Nobody got browbeat into, uh, I mean, there may have been, the only example I could possibly think of uh, was we would occasionally get into some disagreements about landing sites and weather. And uh, often I was on the side of if we wave off the first day, we should call up Edwards and be prepared to land at Edwards if we need it on the second, in the second landing day. Often the program didn't want to do that because if you land at Edwards, you got to get the vehicle back to Florida. And that takes a little time and it takes a little money. It puts the vehicle a little bit at risk if you're flying it on the back of the 747. So there would sometimes be discussions about you know, nah, no, nah, I don't want to call up Edwards on the second landing day. We'll just wave off if, you know, KSC is no good and we'll call up Edwards on the third landing day. Um, I often, I, I didn't, I, I, as a, the flight crew guy, I didn't like that decision, but I also understood as the program guy, he's got, and this is not a safety of flight issue, really. I mean, you can get into a safety of flight issue if, you know, you go to the third extension day, which we did on 61C back in 86, and now something happens and you can't land, you're going to run out of consumables. So you don't like to be, you know, I got to land today because that says, you know, well, that may mean I got to accept whatever weather happens to be there, or I've got to accept an a airfield that I'm not comfortable with. Um, so I didn't like to put the guys in that situation. But, you know, that's kind of protecting for the next failure in that case. 
you know, we have a weather forecast. So, you know, the, I always felt, well, the, pro the program has some rights to, you know, decide how they want to manage, you know, the assets, as long as it's not a safety of flight issue. But that's probably the only real decision where there was ever any, you know, discussion about, you know, I think we should do something else. I didn't want to put in that specific example, because we I'd been through it once and I was a little bit nervous mm -hmm. uh, as we went to our third extension day, because we were already, you know, we were out of most everything <laughs> mm -hmm. and we were reusing lyo canisters for the CO2 management and Charlie Bolden was drawing pictures of what he could see out the window because we didn't have any film left. We were eating the green vegetables out of the pantry because that was all the food we had. <laughs> That is hilarious. And it got so bad. We had, <laughs> we had to eat, eat the vegetables. vegetables. <laughs> yep. You know that. So we were desperate. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, so that was, you know, I didn't really want to put our crews in the situation where, you know, they were really running out of consumables and they were going to be forced to land potentially in, you know, other than a good situation. Mm -hmm. we, we never, in, in the program, we never ended up there. That's amazing. But that's how all of that worked. And um, I remember, <laughs> uh, you know, the, my recollection is the press was sort of playing it, as you might expect, is that, you know, NASA has this problem and the flight rule says you're supposed to land, but, you know, it isn't clear that NASA is going to do that. They're going to ignore their own flight rule. But we didn't ignore it. We just refined it based on analysis and data and simulation. And <clears throat> everything we did was completely defensible. It's an interesting takeaway as well, just about margins, knowing what, what margins you have when you it's have to It's good to know adapt. what they are, yeah, mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and how to protect them. The green vegetable metaphor is fantastic. <laughs> Love that. That's a good margin. I want to get down yeah, to the green if you're, Yeah, if you're eating your green vegetables, you're too near the edge. <laughs> that's, that's right. Oh, my gosh. Well, Maybe I that'll think... be the title of my book. <laughs> <laughs> Try to avoid the green vegetables. Right. We're down to the green. We're down to the greens. Down to the yeah. greens. That's right. <laughs> oh, goodness. I feel like this has just been an incredible conversation and um, I'm just trying to skim to see if we should drill down on anything. What do you think, Sandy? It's, it's been so valuable. Like we're so grateful for your time as well. Like th thanks for sharing your insights. It's, it's mm -hmm. tr genuinely an honor. Uh, anecdotally coming up through the camps that way back in the day with Helen Unruh, we used, to, we used to be able to ask astronauts uh, like one question, you know, as campers. And so this is like a, a, a dreamy um, revisiting of that. So it's, it's really, really great. Um, I, you know, I think the, the one question, you know, and this, this might cap it on my end, is just for young learners, like, you know, big picture, is there any advice that you would have for folks who are, um, in school, they're looking to get into science or space exploration. They're, they're inspired by photos that you took. They're inspired by the Hubble Space Telescope. Like, like what, what, should, they, what should they do to, to stay on track and be successful and yeah. sort of follow their dreams? Um, I thought about that in the context of the question you asked about, you know, if I could go back and give some advice to me when I was a student, what would it yeah, be? Great. Um, what it would be would be challenge yourself. When I was in high school, frankly, uh, high school was pretty easy. Um, you know, I was, you know, I was an A student. My senior year, my goal was to never take a book home at night, to get all my homework done in study hall uh, or in class if the teacher gave us time in class. I did it too, at least for a semester. I don't matter if I did it for the whole year. But I, I didn't take a book home at all for at least a semester. <clears throat> then I got to college. And I took honors calculus. And I suddenly realized, you know, I'll bet none of these guys took a book home either. 
their senior year. <laughs> they were really smart. And I was not the brightest kid in the class, at least not based on my performance on the exams. And I realized that this is a different world. And I was going to have to change my approach. And I was going to have to improve my study habits. And I was going to have to challenge myself to, you know, if I didn't understand something, I was going to have to figure out how to understand it. Um, and that was true when I went to grad school. You know, fortunately, I did well enough in college to get into a good grad school. And now all the people in my grad school class, um, most of whom are still good friends today, you know, they did really well in their colleges. And some of their colleges were Caltech, not KU, no offense to KU, but, you know, one of my best buddies from grad school was a, he graduated from Caltech. And so suddenly now I'm with, you know, these guys not only were really good at college, but they were really good at a really good college. Not again, that KU isn't, but we only had one astronomer on the faculty when I was there as a student. And so once again, I had to figure out, you know, okay, how do I, how do I challenge myself? How do I, uh, do what I need to do to survive in this environment. Uh, and I, I, you know, you could say that even applied when I got selected by NASA. Because suddenly now, you know, some, by some miracle, I get picked. And now I'm in this room with 34 other new shuttle astronauts, all of whom were experts at whatever it was they did. They were all top in their field. <laughs> and so <laughs> I did an interview a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and the guy was asking me a little bit about how I got selected. And, and then he said, well, how did it feel after you were selected to know you were going to fly in space? And I said, I didn't know I was going to fly in space. <laughs> in fact, I didn't. We, we, I was selected into a probation period, a two-year astronaut candidacy program. <clears throat> and you had to perform well enough that at the end of the two years, they, could, they would keep you. The, the problem had been when they picked scientists, astronauts in the late 60s, a lot of them didn't work out. <clears throat> and they didn't want to go through, you know, having a bunch of people quit or having to fire a bunch of people. So they came up with this idea that, we'll create this job called astronaut candidate and we'll hire people into that. And it's a two year job in the terminology. It was called a NASA accepted position. And what happens after two years is the job goes away. It's a two year job. So at that point they can put you in another job called astronaut, or they can let your job go away. Nobody quits. Nobody gets fired. You're just gone. And I didn't assume that, you know, I'd be there after those two years. I didn't know that I could do this job. Um, <clears throat> I'd never done anything like that in my life. So, no, I didn't think I was, you know, that meant I was going to fly in space. And then after we got promoted to astronaut, <clears throat> we still hadn't flown STS-1. And if STS-1 doesn't fly, I'm not going to fly in space. So the first time I thought, you know, actually I might get a chance to fly in space was after STS-1 flew. So long story, go back to the beginning. <clears throat> I would have told myself the real world is a lot harder than you think it is. And there's going to be a lot of competition for all of the slots you want, whether it's in college, whether it's in grad school, whether it's in a, a job that you're interested in. And you need to learn early and often to challenge yourself. And I did have a teacher. And I've, I've told this story before. You may have even heard it, Mimi. I had a 11th grade physics teacher named Stan Lewis. And Mr. Lewis, uh, that was probably my most favorite course. I, I love physics. It was my first real hardcore science course, I think. I might have had a biology course before, but <clears throat> I really was looking forward to taking physics because it was in line with what I wanted to do for a career. And 
it was fun. This will date me, but I'll, I'll say it. Uh, he taught me to use the slide rule, uh, which actually is, is helpful. Um, and I've actually thought it's a mistake that we don't teach kids how to use a slide rule. Because if you use a slide rule, you have to figure out where the decimal point goes, which says you have to estimate the answer. And that is a skill that my experience says a lot of kids don't have. That they don't know how to estimate the answer and then look at what they got and said, does that make any sense? <laughs> but after the first semester, I got an A in the course. <clears throat> and I got my report card and I was looking at it. And down in the comment field, there was uh, five check marks next to the field that said capable of better work. And I knew I was going to have to take that home and have my father sign it. So I went to Mr. Lewis and said, hey, what's the deal with the <laughs> check marks? And he said, well, I didn't think you were working as hard as you could. And I said something really stupid, like, well, I was working as hard as I needed to to get an A in this class. <laughs> or words to that effect. Or words that Mr. Lewis interpreted as saying that. And so he said, well, I'm going to make you a deal. He said, for the second semester, you've got two options. You'll get an A or you'll get an F. And it'll be solely dependent on whether I think you're working to your potential. And I probably allowed us how I didn't think that was fair. And he probably allowed us how he didn't give a crap what I thought. But that was the deal. And he taught me to the importance of applying yourself, you know, particularly in a course that you know you like. I mean, it ought to be the easiest thing in the world to you know work hard at a class you really like. But you know, that was a lesson that stayed with me forever. And so I would go back and say, don't get in trouble with Mr. Lewis, Stevie. <laughs> Just figure out how to challenge yourself. That's awesome. I don't think I ever, I, well, I know I hadn't ever heard that story. And I told it exception. actually to a group of several thousand uh, middle schoolers or junior high. I don't remember how old they were at the uh, basketball arena there in Hutch. Oh. Yeah, probably for the um, 40th anniversary, I think, was the time. Might have been. I, d I don't know. Yeah. It was quite a while ago. Uh, Mr. Lewis had left Salina and gone to Chapman. Mm -hmm. He was he had a farm there, and he was teaching in Chapman, and he brought his class to that <gasps> event. And so I told the story with him there and all those kids. That's amazing. Yeah. Wow. <clears throat> Well, I, I'm really, really grateful for this conversation. And um, we've talked a lot about students and talking to your younger self. What's your, what's your takeaway for leaders, um, particularly in these times when, just as with any mission, everything can change and there's so many variables that we hadn't considered before? So what, what's your advice to, to leaders? Well, the leaders that I have seen that I thought were the best were uh, the ones, uh, there's several dimensions to it, of course, but I thought, you know, the ones who valued communication, I mean, they were honest with their team. You know, they would share information not withhold it. Um, and they were legitimately interested in what their team members thought. Um, I was impressed enough by several people that managed that way that when I was running flight crew operations, um, <clears throat> I had a standing meeting scheduled with all of my direct reports. And, and the deal was you can come in at that time. You know you've got a time once a week. You can come in and tell me whatever you want to tell me. It's not required. If you don't want the time, that's fine. But you've, it's there. It's yours. If you want to come in and talk, you know, then do it. People that, you know, you know, I've always believed that good managers subscribe to the 
the small brain theory is that I'd rather have a lot of small brains than one giant brain. <clears throat> um, so I do think communication is important. Um, people need to know, you know, where, where are we heading? What's the goal? And that has to be a common goal. Uh, now at NASA, that was relatively easy, at least at JSC it was because, you know, at, you know, at least some level, we all had a common goal of, of developing, training for, and successfully executing human spaceflight. We had disagreements from time to time about how's the best way to do that, but we had a common goal. And so that's maybe why things like the MMT work so well, because, you know, we all wanted to get to the same place. It was just sometimes we would discuss how to get there. <clears throat> um, yeah, so what other traits would I say I have admired? Um, you need to know the business. Your pe people have to know that you know the business that you're all engaged in. Again, at JSC, that was relatively easy um, because most of the people that became program managers, you know, came out of the operational community. And so they, they really did know the business. Now, the problem was <laughs> in some cases, they, we couldn't get them to get the hell out of the operational business once they became managers. <clears throat> um, you, need, uh, you need to be decisive, make, make decisions when the time comes. Again, NASA was good at that. You know, you got an eight and a half minute launch. <clears throat> and so the flight director, you know, as things happen, you know, he's got to analyze everything people are telling him. And, and, you know, if he needs to make a decision, he's got to make a decision. He has to make it now. Not all problems are like that. Of course, you have time to work them. Uh, but you have to be prepared to make the tough call. Um, I've got a lot of stories I could tell about, about you know, people that did that. Um, <laughs> I remember one of the stories I love telling is I wasn't there, but I knew the people involved and that was Apollo 11 moon landing. <clears throat> uh, you may, the, you may know the story, but, uh, you know, they were coming down and they had a 1201 computer alarm and, uh, Neil reports it, you know, 1201 alarm and <clears throat> the guy was in the back room was a ended up being a friend of mine years later, a guy named Jack Garman. And he was a software expert. And on his own initiative, about a year before, he had gone through and documented all of the alarms the computer could enunciate and what would cause it. Nobody told him to do that, but he thought, well, that'd be a useful thing to know. And so he knew what that alarm meant, what it meant was the computer was overloaded and the software was really brilliantly designed and the shuttle software was designed similarly in that different software routines had priorities. And so, you know, navigating was a high priority task. Updating a display was probably a low priority task. But what the computer was saying was I'm not getting everything done. And so it was not doing the low priority task. Jack knew that. So Jack told his front room controller, a guy named Steve Bales, that we're, we're go with that. And Steve told Gene Kranz, the flight director, he said, flight, we're go with that alarm. Gene told Charlie Duke, tell the crew we're go. Charlie says, we're go on that. The only person in that entire conversation that knew what the hell they were talking about was Jack Garman. But the takeaway was everybody, first of all, everybody trusted everybody else to be really good at their job. And everybody trusted everybody else on the team. So when Steve told Gene, we're go, Gene said, we're go. Because he trusted Steve and Steve's people. He didn't know what 1201 meant. I mean, he, may, he knew it was a computer alarm, but he didn't know what was causing it. I'll bet you anything, <clears throat> but he knew Steve and Steve told Gene, we're good with that. So, you know, that's been one of the stories I've always loved to tell about, you know, how a really good team operates. The people are 
They know their job. They know what their job is. They know how to do their job. And the leaders know they know how to do their job and they trust them. That is a fantastic illustration. And mm-hmm. it's interesting because that's one of the core elements that keeps surfacing in all of the interviews that Sandy has done and that we've done together. And that again, Andy Chaikin was just talking about that as well. And uh, it's that we, we all know that the speed of trust and everything else that's been written about it is something that people look for, but it was critical. <laughs> and, and, and in a more general sense, I mean, I suppose leaders need to keep in mind, you know, that the trust works both ways, you know, you know, you got to trust your people, but they need to trust you. And, you know, I've seen leaders who might do things intentionally or otherwise that would suggest maybe you can't trust them. You know, for example, if you got a set of rules and somehow some people don't seem to have to abide by those rules, but other people do, you begin to think, I don't know if I can trust this guy. And once you get to that point, you're in big trouble. It's such a good point as well. Like on the, on the trust, it's, it's in that human element. It seems like when there's such a high pressure situation and literally everybody in the world is watching, like no exaggeration. And in that moment, when you have a human reaction that might be one to two seconds to either trust somebody implicitly or question it. Right. And it's right it's now, piece, which is again, in our business, um, you had time to work that out mm-hmm. because you would have been through, you know, you know, months and months and months of simulations with your team. It, you know, it goes for us as the crew, but it's also mission control. So you have a chance to see who's good. You have a chance to interact so that when the time comes, You've developed, you have a basis for, for trusting the people on your team, or, or maybe you've made changes by the time you launch and, you know, you get a new team, but um, it, it'd be, there's a, John Shannon was our flight director when we launched SCS 93 and had the electrical short and the nozzle leak and the uh, underspeed at Miko. Um he did an interview about his leadership style and I think he right on, he, he said, you know, probably the best flight director is a, uh, and he included himself in this characterization was, uh, you know, the, the benevolent de- dictator, you know, you have to be in charge, you have to be demanding, you have to make decisions, but <clears throat> you can do it in a way where you're still, you know, uh, you still show trust in your team. You let them work the problem until, you know, a decision has to be made. Uh, and I think all the flight directors are like that. Maybe some not quite as benevolent as others, but, <laughs> but again, it's not like that was the first time they'd ever been together. You know, I mean, part of the reason that we do what we do or did what we did was, you know, you need to feel like you've been there a thousand times when you do it for real. And uh, so you have a time to time to work all that out, and 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 uh, you know we did it on all the crews I was on. Different commanders had different approaches to how they wanted to do business, but we had time to work work all that out. I tried to get them all to use Hoots rule. I don't know that I was successful. <laughs> the other thing we called, I'm not sure I came up with this or not, but. <clears throat> The, the other way you can characterize Hoots rule is, you know, you used to call it the pilot's rule, I guess, is that no matter how bad you think things are, you can always make it worse. <laughs> and, and that was actually an important lesson, too, because sometimes the right thing to do is nothing. I mean, I think everybody instinctively wants to do something. Mm-hmm. And, and often that's right, but sometimes it's not. Sometimes the right thing is just let's hands off now. Let's, you know. Not make things worse by guessing. I think Gene said that after the Apollo 13 explosion. 
he said, let's, you know, let's not make things worse by guessing. The, the takeaway in that I think is really interesting. Um, and I think it'd be really useful for all age in that Mimi is the, the foundations for trust, right? Mm-hmm. Right. And the, the idea that you're building the foundation so that you're not guessing, you know, you're in a situation where you don't have to make wild guesses. You built the foundation with the crew so that you know that you can trust each other, but there's a tremendous amount of simulation and work beforehand. Right. That into that. right. You have a basis for building that, that trust and confidence. Mm-hmm. I feel like if I was an embroider, embroiderer, which I'm not, I don't do needlework, but I feel like I have the fodder for a hundred pillows and these quotes <laughs> and takeaways. <laughs> oh, I need that Write them down pillow. and send them back to me because I won't remember what they were. <laughs> I love, you can always make things worse. <laughs> yeah, it's true. <laughs> and you know, the, the sometimes the right thing to do is nothing. Um, all of that. And, and if you feel that, that you need to feel like you've done it a thousand times to be ready to do it for real, that's, that's really critical. Um, yeah. So thank you. Yeah. It's not, that. it's not glamorous, but, uh, I don't know. I, I remember from time to time being asked, you know, what was it like the moment the engine stopped on your first launch and then i say well i was still on the ground when the engine stopped on my first launch <laughs> no and you saw the earth you know for the first time. what was your, you know as you're looking at the what was the first thing you thought of after your your first ascent and and the truthful answer is boy the simulations are really good <laughs> and you know launch is such a bizarre experience that you really need to be trained in a way that even if first thing to do is nothing, that your brain will take you in the right direction while, you know, everything else tries to catch up. Hmm. You know, if something happens instinctively, you kind of know what to do, at least, you know, start to do. And then you can, you know, you got a second to kind of analyze the situation. Uh, and <clears throat> so I, I think, you know, yeah, we were lucky to be able to go through something that would prepare us as well as you could possibly be prepared to undergo something as bizarre as, you know, 7 million pounds of thrust. Right. Right. You know, I can't, in my job, I don't, I don't have an opportunity to do a lot of that. (laughs) And he comes from a background where he may have had rehearsals. We do a lot of that um, worst case scenario thinking going into events or big activities, but day to day, I'm sure I could find ways to work it in more. Um, I do want Sandy to get to hear a story that won't come up in these questions, but, um, so the fact is that Steve was beginning to feel rather unlucky. Did you have the most aborts? Um, well, it depends. You have to, we have to define our terms. Oh, <laughs> um, if you mean abort, you know, what do you mean by abort? Uh, well, that you didn't get to take off. Okay. So let me tell you how I define things. Okay. Um, there's some, I, I, there's a slip, something I refer to as a slip, something I refer to as a scrub. And then of course there's a launch. Um, now, there's a difference between how NASA refers to slips and how I do. A slip is basically just a change of launch date. And NASA counts a slip from the time the flight, whatever it is, was actually baselined in the manifest. <clears throat> I count slips as if I'm in Florida ready to launch and the delay a day you know, because of paperwork or, or something. That's a slip for me. NASA counts a scrub if they start fueling the tank, but don't launch. That's not a scrub for me. I count a scrub if I went out to the vehicle and strapped in and we don't launch. So you'll find some discrepancies in the documentation about how many scrubs I've had. 
because, you know, there, back in the early days, you would get up uh, five hours before. No, I'm sorry. You would get up after they started the tanking. And there were a few times I can remember where they would come and knock on my door and say, go back to sleep. We're not going to launch today because <laughs> they had found a problem, you know, once they started taking. So NASA counts that as a scrub, but I didn't. But the answer is yes. <laughs> and I forget the number. It's something like 15 uh, scrubs and five launches and some number of slips. I think it was four or five slips that, that I count. So, yes, I have the most number of scrubs. Um, probably by far. I think the people in second place or third place are the people that flew with me. <laughs> so. <laughs> So to that end, tell Sandy what you did because you were beginning to feel a little bit personally related. Yeah, well, I had had, let's see, we had had uh, three scrubs on my first flight. And on my second flight, I think we had five or six. And we still were on the ground. And I began to think, you know, well, maybe it's me. But then I thought, actually, it could be Tip Talone. Tip was a friend of mine. He was the flow director for both my first flight and the second flight. So I thought, well, it could be Tip. <laughs> but <coughs> so uh, <clears throat> I came up with this idea, which I got Hoot's permission to execute. <clears throat> and under the assumption that it was me, I thought if the orbiter did not recognize me, then we might launch. <clears throat> and so I gray taped over my name tag and I got a Groucho Marx glasses, nose and mustache disguise and wore it into the white room. <coughs> and we launched. And that became something of a tradition afterwards. Uh, I remember, <coughs> excuse me. I don't think I had it for STS-31, but <clears throat> I was in the launch control center. Uh, might have been for my first launch as a flight crew operations guy where I was at the, you know, one of the consoles in the firing room. And the launch director was a guy named Jim Harrington, who was a friend of mine. And the flow director for that flight, I don't remember exactly which, I think it was Dave Walker's flight, but I don't remember for sure. Um, the, the flow director was Tip, and they were sitting on the at the launch director console, and I hear, you know, the launch director calling me, and so I re responded, and and Jim says, "Where's your mask?" <laughs> and I said, "I don't have a mask." <laughs> he says, "Well, you need to get a mask." <laughs> and I said, I'm, "I don't have a mask. I'm not going to go get a mask." <clears throat> so sometime later. Somebody shows up with a grocery bag where they had cut out, you know, eye holes and drawn a glasses, nose and mustache on it. And and they wanted me to put it on. And I thought that would be highly unprofessional. Uh, and I didn't want to do it. And they were giving me grief. And so finally, I said, look, <clears throat> if everything is going fine at the T minus nine minute hold, I'll put it on. Okay, so now the interesting part of the story is if they knew, they didn't tell me. But at the T minus nine minute hold, the vice president was coming into the control center to talk to the crew. And so here I am with this grocery bag, and Dan Quayle walks into the control room. And, you know, Tip and Jim are sitting there at the launch director console laughing their butts off going like you know this <laughs> and so in order to save what little face i could <laughs> i did actually briefly put the bag over my head when the vice president was doing something else and not looking in my direction so technically i fulfilled the the promise uh on sts 82 <clears throat> uh pam melroy was the uh closeout crew member and she brought a bag into the vehicle <laughs> Uh, with the face painted on it. And then for SGS-93, somebody 
brought a bag to the white room. <laughs> and I will tell you this. I went and looked it up, as a matter of fact. The mask was four for four. Every time I had the mask, we lunched. <laughs> Five for five, if you want to count the Dan Quayle. <laughs> I do. I definitely want to count Because we, did, that we did actually launch that day. That's a, just a, the greatest story. And I'm not a superstitious person, but that might make me one. <laughs> I actually didn't even remember that it had a perfect record until I, I was, had some reason a few months ago to go back and count. Mm-hmm. How many? Because so many people asked me, and I, I never knew for sure what the number was, mm -hmm. how many scrubs I had had. Mm -hmm. um, so I actually did some research into, and, and there's some ambiguity because on one attempt on 61C, we actually scrubbed twice. <clears throat> and I only counted it as once. Well, it's not as it doesn't sound as if there was anybody else close behind you, so. <laughs> I don't think so. And I, I can't imagine any more that, you know, as infrequently as we'll be flying, that anybody will have a chance to come close to the record. I love that. Thank you so much for sharing that story. Not only the leader in Scrubs, but also the usage of Groucho Marx masks, which, by the <laughs> way, guaranteed for space flight. I think it should have that on the package when they're actually selling those. Masks. It's a good point. Guaranteed yeah. to take you to orbit. <laughs> I don't know that anybody else ever had to resort to something like that. Wow. <laughs> but, That's so great. The opposite of the warning on the Superman costume. This warning says, <laughs> warning. <laughs> <laughs> this mask may lead to space. May flight. lead to flight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, goodness. Well, thank you both so much for this. It's been great. Sure.